Hey, welcome back to Snapball Games. My name is Max, and I'm here today to talk about the new Commander Legend set, Battle for Baldur's Gate. And typically, when a new set comes out, I like to do a top five commons for Popper from each set, along with some honorable mentions that I think could see play or that I just want to discuss for any reason. But because this is a Commander set for Popper, we're going to be getting so many playable cards that I figured I should do one video discussing a lot of the commons, and now I'm going to do a separate top five video that you can keep an eye out for. It'll be coming out after this video. A separate top five video that just gets right down to the top five, and this will be just a larger discussion of so many other cards in the set. Um, we're going to get right into talking about this blessed hippogriff here in a second. Before we do, I real quick wanted to shout out my YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash snapbolt. Really appreciate it if you subscribe to the channel. It really helps me out. Thank you so much for doing that. There was one more thing I needed to note before we get into all these cards as well. And that was, there was an announcement from Wizards saying, oh, we're not, we weren't really able to get all the Baldur's Gate cards. Uh, out on Magic Online, so we may only be re releasing a selection of them in treasure chests, which is really disappointing. I'm going to get a little bit more into this at the end of the video after the discussion, but I really just wanted to touch on it and uh, show my disappointment that we might not be getting all the cards on Magic Online. Popper on Magic Online could look a lot different from Popper in real life if we don't end up getting all these cards, because a lot of them are really powerful. Like I said, I'll get into that more at the end. Let's get right into these cards. So the first card from Baldur's Gate, the commander set, that I want to talk about is this Blessed Hippogriff. It is a four mana two three, but there is a cycle of these cards that all have adventure. Um, and I think they're all pretty powerful. So I'm going to talk about a lot of them here. Um, let's just read this card. So the adventure card that you cast first, when you cast this, if you don't know, you cast this adventure part. And then it, it goes into exile, and then you can cast a creature from exile. So... Tyre's Blessing, one white instant. Target creature gains indestructible until end of turn. Then it goes on an adventure into exile. Then you can cast the Blessed Hippogriff, the four mana, two, three flying. Whenever Blessed Hippogriff attacks, target attacking creature without flying gains flying until end of turn. Great. So I think this card seems pretty strong to me. Think about it. The one deck where I could see it seeing some play is Mono White Heroic or the Mono White Menace. It's just... um. One mana, give your creature indestructible is decent, but then, just like Bone Crusher Giant, you play the adventure, and then you have this reasonable creature on the back end. Of course, this isn't as good as Bone Crusher Giant, but in that deck, it seems pretty good. Getting to protect a creature, and then later, getting just an expensive flyer with a good ability, just seems pretty solid to me. Um, so I like this card, just a decent protection spell. I think the value of getting the creature on the back end may make it better than some other one mana protection spell options, but we'll see if that ends up being the case. And there's, like I said, a lot to talk about here, so I'm going to start moving a little bit quicker. Second card I want to talk about is Guardian Naga. Again, I'm going to talk about all these adventure creatures. The adventure part is Vanishing Coils, three mana instant exile target artifact or enchantment. That's a decent card, just that card is okay. Revoke Existence sees some play. It's a pretty solid option. There is also this exact card, 3 mana instant, exile target artifact or enchantment with cycling too. But this on the backside, you just get this expensive kind of fatty creature. Um, so I can see it being good for that reason, especially if we don't see any affinity nerves. This could be an option in some weird ramp deck where you just get the value out of exiling. Maybe you're bouncing this back to your hand or you know, somehow getting this part of the card multiple times um, by rebuying the creature or something like that. So just something to look out for. Nice one to touch on. Next card I want to talk about is Pegasus Guardian. This adventure is two mana instant, exile target creature you control, then return it to the battlefield under its owner's control. Now, this has a lot to compete with with Ephemerate because Ephemerate is basically half the cost, one mana, and does it twice. This on the backside, you get a 6 mana 3-3 three, three flying with some upside. I don't know if this one's quite good enough, but I just wanted to talk about all of these because, sure, the creature on the backside for most of these common adventure creatures is really expensive, but if you're grinding through a game, especially if you're a deck with, like, Mole Drifters, you blink the Mole Drifter, you're drawing more cards, eventually you just start, you cast with 6 mana 3-3 three, three flying when you run out of stuff, other stuff to do. That's pretty good. So if you're happy with the front side, just this adventure part, then you cast the 6 mana 3-3. I think that's a pretty good spot to be. But let's just keep moving right along. 
Next card I want to talk about is Young Red Dragon. The instant, the adventure is an instant. Two mana, create a treasure token. That's pretty weak overall for the card, um, for a card. Um, but then you're getting a four mana, three, two flying camp lock on the backside. I have some doubts about this one. I don't think it's quite strong enough. Um, but I could see some weird deck where you want a two mana instant that you can just hold up that if you don't need to do anything else, you just create a treasure and think, what if you go like turn one Fjord, turn two Island, pass, leave up counterspell. Okay, I don't need to counter anything. Make a treasure, untap, just slam a, a gold dragon on turn three. Um, plus, if there's other ways to utilize the treasure in your deck, then you just get the free value of this kind of medium sized flyer on the back end. Not too bad. This is probably the worst one I've covered so far though. Let's keep moving. Next card I want to talk about, Colossal Badger. At first when I read this card, I was like, okay, this won't see any play. This is a bad adventure creature. But I think it could see play in one particular spot, and that is the tor uh, X Dex Tortured Existence deck that everyone wants me to play, <laughs> which I haven't played yet. Um, so the sorcery is two mana, choose target creature, mill four cards, then put a plus one plus one counter on that creature for each creature milled this way. So it's a decent mill spell that makes one of your creatures a little bit bigger. And if you have a deck with like half creatures, you're often, you know, with 30 creatures, you're going to average two plus one plus one counters on this card uh, from this card plus mill four. And then you might be able to do some shenanigans because after you, you could discard this, it's a creature in the graveyard, you can get it back. You also just get the six mana, six, five, game three on the back end. Still probably not good enough, but maybe that deck wants it, or maybe not the Tordex deck, but if you're the weird, it doesn't really see that much play, but Gurmag Angler, Hooting Mandrels, you want to milk a bunch of creatures and then put plus one, plus one counters on your stuff, maybe it can do something. Next adventure creature, like I said, there's a lot of these. I, I like these. I think they're just a lot of value. I don't, I'm not saying these are all going to see play, but I just wanted to talk about them because I think people overall are going to underestimate them a little bit. Just like Bone Crusher Giant, when that came out, people were like saying, oh, it's not that, it, it's so-so, but it's just a shock or whatever, but the body is really good on it. Um, and just the value of these adventure creatures is not to be underestimated, as we've seen because the, th the set Throne of Eldraine, when these came out, the, so many of the adventure creatures, Brazen Bar or Bone Crusher, like I mentioned, are just so broken. So this is just a two mana bad preordain and then a five mana 3-3 three, three flying. Seems like so-so, but um, could see some play if you just want to grind. Who knows? Okay, now these last two, I saved the best two for last. Um, and I'm really excited about these two for a, one specific reason. Let me read this card, I'll read the next card, and then I'm going to talk about why I'm excited about them. So this is Sword Coast Serpent. Um, let me read the adventure part first, because that's what I've been doing. Capsizing Wave, two mana, instant, return to a creature to its owner's hand. And I want to read this first because this is the cheaper part of the card for all these. So you need to be okay with just this as your card. And then sometimes you get this side of the card. So this is just two mana bounce a creature. That's obviously not good enough. Um, and then you just get a seven mana six, six. That's what that can be unblockable or something. Sure. But you get a two mana bounce spell and it's a seven drop. Next card I want to talk about is similar Fang Dragon. I think this is the actual good one. Forktail Sweep is the uh, adventure part. Two mana sorcery. It deals one damage to each creature you don't control. That's actually pretty good um, in Popper. There's a lot of one toughness things. If you're playing against a fairy deck, um, they have a bunch of one toughness stuff. You just get to wrath them, and then you get this win condition in the late game, which is a seven mana 6-3 flying. And that's actually pretty huge. So this card is the one I'm most excited about, about this adventure cycle. Maybe even in the sideboard of something like Ponza, or the main deck, um, because you get a cheap card that can be good in situationally, and then an overcosted fatty. Seven mana, six, three flying, obviously not good, but when Forktail Sweep is good, this card is very, very good. So I'm excited for these two. Specifically, like I mentioned, there's a reason, and that is because I have this brew in mind. I went, I started brewing it a little bit on a, a previous stream, but it's actually a five color cascade deck with a bunch of the cascaders because a lot of the cascade cards are legal in popper then you cascade down to three drops so you can play any three drops you want um 
but then you won't hit these expensive seven mana cards on any of your cascaders so you can always guarantee cascade down to certain cards uh, i won't give away too much because i'm going to brew it uh, if we get these cards um, and then you get some early interaction with capsizing wave as a bounce spell to buy time fork tail sweep as a wrath and then um, you can always cascade into a powerful three drop every time especially post board imagine bringing in dust to dust and you every time you cast a cascade spell you hit dust to dust it's pretty nice uh, hopefully we'll be able to see that brew if all these cards come out. Next card I want to touch on is Blur. This is 3 mana instant. Exile target creature you control, then return it to the battlefield under its owner's control. Draw a card. This card seems really sweet to me. Is it better than Ghostly Flicker? I'm not sure. Does a deck like Familiars want one Ghostly Flicker, one Blur? Maybe. Because you can get in situations where you can cast infinite Ghostly Flickers in Familiars, um, but there could be times where you're like, okay, I just want to blur five times and just draw five with Archaeomancer and Mnemonic Wall, stuff like that. Um, so if you're just casting blur on, on like, let's say, a Mnemonic Wall, then you just get back blur, you just drew a card. Um, and then you can also just blink other stuff like Moldrifter for value. Not sure if it's quite strong enough, but uh, it's just one to watch out for. All right, this one... I don't know about this one. Miracles Barbarian. Two mana, two, two. It's a dragon, um, which could matter, but probably not yet. Sacrifice Reckless Barbarian, add two mana. The only reason I put this on here, I just wanted to touch on it, and that is because I don't know if there's some weird combos with this where you can keep bringing it back and just keep making a bunch of mana. Nothing that I know of yet, um, but maybe there's some way to abuse this and. Uh, maybe there's some deck that just wants to go two into five drop with this, something like that. I don't think it's going to be good if there's no combo with it, but just watch out. Sack add two mana is like a delayed ritual, which can be really good because you don't have to pay the mana to get two mana. So you can get to a really high mana threshold early if that's what you're looking to do. All right. This card is sweet. Druid of the Emerald Grove, four mana, two, two. When Druid of the Emerald Grove enters the battlefield, search your library for two basic lands, reveal them, then roll a d20. If Let's just look at the first two options, because that's pretty much always what's going to happen. One through nine, put both of those cards into your hand. Okay, so about half the time, you're going to play a four mana 2-2, two, two, search for two basics, you draw them. The other half of the time, you got to cultivate. Put one of those onto the battlefield, tap the other one into your hand. So if you're hitting that Cultivate, that's much stronger because then you're getting like almost like a Solemn Simulacrum. Four mana, you get a land onto the battlefield and a land into your hand. And you don't have to wait for it to die, obviously. So imagine flickering this. You can just like thin your deck of all your lands ramping while you're doing that. So if you're like ephemerating this, you're getting a ton of value. The, the 20 mode is just put both onto the battlefield. But realistically, you're going to hit one, you know, 19 out of 20 times, you're going to hit one of the first two options. Um, so, I don't know, I think this card seems sweet, I don't know where it would go, like, why do you want to get all the lands out of your deck? It's probably better to just flicker something like Moldrifter, um, but you are ramping while you're doing this, um, so seems pretty cool. Just, I just kind of like this card, it, uh, it just seems sweet, so maybe I'll play with it at some point. Alright, now we're starting to get into some slightly better ones. Mold Folk, 2 mana 1-1 one, one lifelink. Mold Harvest. Because this is the themed, uh, you know, set from like a DD and d theme, a lot of the abilities have like, they're just named, so it's called Mold Harvest. One mana, it doesn't mean anything though, it just adds more unnecessary text in my opinion, but <laughs> it's flavor. One mana, sack another creature or artifact, put a plus one plus one counter on it. I could see playing one or two of these in Affinity, or maybe even more. Um, you do have to pay one where with a tog you didn't have to pay any mana, which is why a tog was so good. But this is this has lifelink. So if you just play one or two in affinity, it seems decent because you like draw so many cards, you often get up to a lot of mana. Let's say you have eight lands in play, you play this, and the opponent's probably like, shoot, I can't really burn it, because they could just sack a bunch of stuff, like if your wellsprings and lands, then they just end up with like a six-six lifelink. And at that point in the game, that could be pretty good, pretty hard to deal with. Plus, burn just has to kill it and sometimes they won't be able to and then you win um so this one seems powerful like i said i could see affinity wanting one or just if you want like a sack outlet it's also pretty decent because it's a one one lifelink that gets bigger so yeah seems pretty sweet i like this card a lot 
Let's keep moving. This one is maybe one that I'm most excited for in the set. This was in contention to be on my top five, actually, um, but it didn't quite get there. Cloakwood Swarmer, one mana, one one. When it enter, uh, when one or more tokens enter the battlefield under your control, put a plus one plus one counter on Cloakwood Swarmkeeper. I am really excited about this one because I had a brew a while back, Jun Gardens. It was a Jun tokens deck with Colony Garden um, and Glimmer Baron. And I, I was actually working on brewing uh, the, the new version with this card, but this seems really good in that deck. Of course, that deck's also playing called Author Rebirth, uh, Deadly Dispute. Of course, the card's broken. Um, Experimental Synthesizer, you know, cards like that. Um, so this seems like you can get, get out of hand in that deck pretty quick, especially if you're getting a lot of tokens from Colony Garden. You can get random treasures. Uh, you can even play Jewel Thief to get a treasure to trigger this. So this seems this seems pretty dope. I'm excited to try this one out. And again, I think it seems powerful. I think it might take that deck from, you know, that deck was never tier one, but it was strong. It might take it to like a tier 1.5, tier two level, where it was a little bit below that before, because it was a little inconsistent with the mana. All right, this one's sweet too. Four mana, four one, fungus. When it enters the battlefield, destroy up to one target artifact or enchantment. This seems really good to me. We don't have like a Rex Sage or anything as far as I know in Popper. Um, we do have things that enter the battlefield and destroy an artifact, but the ability to do either one is really strong. Plus four mana, four one. Sure, it's a little vulnerable, but it's just an okay body, especially with that effect. Um, I really like this card. If you start flickering this against Affinity, uh, it's just gonna be it's just gonna be lights out. Really like this one. I think this one will will see some play. Like absolutely, definitely will. All right, let's keep moving. Now we're on to some artifacts here. I like this one a lot too. Um, the Cantor of Endless Water. Artifact for three mana. Tap add one mana of any color, and you have no maximum hand size. I think. You have no maximum hand size is actually just a little bit underrated. It shouldn't be everything, and you probably don't want more than one or maybe two of these in some decks. Um, but actually, like I was playing decks like Evoke, and sometimes it's good to be able to discard a card, but sometimes you actually don't want to have to discard the hand size. I can see this being good specifically in you know Flickertron. Um, just playing maybe one of these. Because this no maximum hand size ability actually is decent um, in certain situations. And then it's just a three mana add one mana of any color mana rock. Not sure if it quite gets there. There's a lot of options for three mana add one mana of any color now. But just like to keep that in mind. It's kind of a cool card. And again, this effect in certain decks can be really good. Especially in some combo decks. You could build up a huge hand and then do some pretty broken stuff with all that with all that mana or all those cards you have. Like then you'd go for like a Tolarian wins or something weird when, when you have like 15 cards in hand because uh, you didn't have to discard for a couple turns. So pretty sweet. All right, I like this one. This is a fixed Bonders ornament, basically. Three mana, tap, add one mana of any color. Another good option there. And then four mana, tap. Look at the top card of your library. If it's a land, you can put it onto the battlefield tapped. If you don't put the card onto the battlefield, you may put it on the bottom. So let's just talk about what this actually means, the, the ability there. It's four mana, look at the top card. If it's a land, you get to put it into play. So essentially drawing and playing that card. If it's a non-land, you can scry one, put it to the bottom or leave it on top, right? You may put it on the bottom. Let me make sure. Yeah, if you don't put it onto the battlefield, you may put it on the bottom. So you can leave it on top. So it's four mana tap, look at the top card. If it's a land, put it into play. Otherwise scry one essentially. Um, not as good as Bonder's Ornament, but Bonder's Ornament is banned, so maybe this helps bring Tron back. I mean, when you're just sitting there with like double lantern and 12 mana and you're like, okay, I don't need to do anything, activate, activate, you're just getting a huge advantage. You're not actually drawing cards, but you could just be scrying towards what you need, scrying towards your Mold Drifters or your Rolling Thunder or wh whatever you want. Um, so I, I really like this one, especially for Flicker Tron, so watch out. Flicker Tron may be coming back. All right, let's move right along. This one is sweet. Nimble right schematic. Two mana artifact. When it enters the battlefield or is put into a graveyard, create a 1-1 one, one Carlos Con uh, Construct artifact creature token. And this is basically like a, a rework of Icar Wellspring. Instead of getting to draw a card, you get a 1-1 one, one token each time. A couple things to note on this card. 
Um, it's a two mana artifact that makes another artifact. So similar to like Blood Fountain, it, you get multiple artifacts for one card. So that's you know that could see some play in Affinity because that you know you play this on two, you play an artifact land, artifact land, and then play this. You're up to four artifacts already just with this. Then you know getting the one one isn't too bad. Maybe there's certain things you can do with it. Um, maybe you want to play called Author Rebirth with this. You play this, you get a one one. You sack it to rebirth. You get four more one ones, and then next turn you just like you know play some type of overrun, kill them. So could see some play. I was thinking about adding it to Jund Gardens. I'm not sure if it's gonna quite get there for that deck, but uh, could see some play. Maybe not. I, I still think Ichor Wellspring is better, um, but this card could see some play. And now there's another card. It's just like this one, but a little bit different, and that is Prize Statue. Two mana, it's also like an Icker Wellspring, but instead of drawing or making a 1-1, you get a treasure when it enters or is put into a graveyard. Um, so this is actually, like again, an artifact that gives you two artifacts, and it helps fix your mana, and um, similar to like Deadly Dispute, if you're, imagine going Deadly Dispute, sack Prize Statue, you literally just got a free two mana, like a zero draw two, a zero mana draw two because you get a treasure from Deadly Dispute and a treasure from this. And if you're doing anything with tokens, this gets better because you're putting tokens into play. If you need the, the color fixing from this, this is also strong. So just watch out for these. I still think Icar Wellspring is better than both of them, but maybe you want four Icar Wellspring and then, you know, one of these, one of these, or four Icar Wellspring, two schematic. There's certainly setups I can see like that being powerful. So something to look out for. All right, we're getting towards the end of these cards I want to talk about today. There's a couple more, though. Let's talk about this land. There is a whole cycle of these. This one is Seagate. It enters the battlefield tapped. When it enters the battlefield, choose a color other than blue. And then you can add blue mana or one mana of the chosen color. So this is exactly like the thriving land that we already have, except it has land type gate, which just means it's just straight up. There's no downsides to gates that I know of yet. It's just straight up better than the thriving cycle again there's one of these for each color i'm just not going to show all of them but there's there's five of them um so it's just straight up better than the thriving cycle um and they're already printed in this set a couple lands that have gate synergy which i'm going to get to in a second but basically these are also good because if you're like a blue based multicolor deck you could play four of these and some of the thriving blue lands too and now you have all your lands can produce blue essentially and you have a lot of splash lands because um, a lot of the blue control decks would play four thriving isle for a while and then it's easy to splash off that because you get you can add, like add whatever other color you need but you still can cast counterspell because all your lands produce blue so yeah these seem sweet now let's get to the next cards there's two other lands that have synergy at common with gates this is also a gate itself and it's a filter land. So it comes in untapped, which is great. It adds one mana, and then you can tap one and tap it to add one mana of any color. And you can tap one mana, tap this, and another untapped gate you control to create a treasure. So that's kind of expensive, but it's essentially like three mana make a treasure because you have to tap a land to pay for it, this card, and a gate. But that seems like it's pretty good to me because anytime you have three mana that you don't use in a grindy game, you're just like, make treasure, make treasure, make treasure. Plus, this cycle of gates, these are just pretty good mana fixtures. These are just good cards. They're just better than dual lands. Um, so getting this as a decent filter land, um, which can be good, especially if you're like a five color cascade deck, let's say, then getting to make treasures when you're not doing anything seems really nice. This is the wrong card here, so hold up. Okay, I got the card up now. This is the other gate that gives synergy. This is Basilisk Gate. It's a land gate, enters untapped, and it adds colorless mana. And tap two, tap it. Target creature gets plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of gates you control. Activate only as a sorcery. So it's like a bad pump spell, but it's on your land. So that seems pretty good. I could envision a mana base with like see yeah this so that card that i showed was just another one of the that gate cycle i must have just opened it by mistake but i can see a lot of these tapped gate lands that add fixing then you get to play this filter land which is good in a multicolor deck that can create treasures and then you also get basilisk gate as just like you're like okay i have seven lands 
well, I'll give my thing plus seven, plus seven every turn. What are you going to do? Every creature I play, you're just going to start tapping Basilisk Gate. And all, most of my lands are gates. So I'm just going to get, like, you know, a huge bonus while having a good multicolor mana base. Because this and the Filter Land are both untapped lands. You can't play that many of this card, especially if you're, you know, like a big multicolor deck. But um, I see I see it being pretty good. So uh, that's the mana base I'm going to try in that crazy five-color Cascade deck. Um, okay, that's all the cards I have to talk about in this video, but like I said, keep an eye out. I'm going to have another video coming out shortly, it'll be the next video, where I'm going to talk about the top five cards. If you want to, you can go through the entire spoiler, look at all the commons, see which cards in this list that are good that I did not talk about. You can probably deduce my top five, but keep an eye out for that. But before I go, I just wanted to touch on the announcement from Wizards about not adding these cards one more time, because I really did want to, you know, just take a little bit more time and, you know, voice my opinion on what, what's happening and really just, you know, display, just show my disappointment that we're not getting all the cards on Magic Online. And I think it's just a pretty big detriment to the game if Magic Online, Popper and Magic Online is different than real life. That's really bad for the format, and it just kind of feels like it shows they don't really care about um, Magic Online as much, especially with Arena and everything. So let's talk about it. Okay, <clears throat> here is the announcement uh, that they released. And let me just read at least the top paragraph here. The tabletop pre-release weekend for Commander Legends Battle for Baldur's Gate starts on June 3rd, and many Magic Online players are wondering what to expect from the set. While a full Magic Online release to coincide with the tabletop release wasn't achievable for Commander Legends Baldur's Battle for Baldur's Gate, we will be adding a selection of cards from the set to Magic Online in Treasure Chest starting on June 15th. So again, that's basically it. I'm pretty disappointed because Think about it. I didn't even do the top five, and I just talked about, what, 20 cards that could potentially see play in Popper. So I did want to try to come at this from a positive angle and be like, just look, I love magic. I love playing it, playing the game. You know, I love brewing. But if we don't have all these cards, it's just going to feel almost like we're playing a fake format, um, you know, because we don't have all the cards, but we will have them in real life. There's no reason these cards can't get added to Magic Online. And if you said in this announcement, hey, look, we're having trouble. We're going to release some of the cards um, in treasure chests, and then later we're going to release the other cards. I'd be like, sure, that's totally understandable. You know, you weren't able to get all the cards out, but if you just pick through the set and go, okay, we're adding like what I think are the top seven commons, and I say, hey, wait a second, I think this common is good for this reason. I wanted to play with that. So now it's just like we're getting a curated set, but then in real life you can play with the other commons. So, um, just just kind of yeah pretty disappointing it's just uh I don't, I don't know really what else to say except except that if they go on to say this we are keeping an eye on which commander legends cards emerge as favorites in the commander community and as we develop a plan to release more of the cards from this set we will share details with you here so maybe they will say okay we're going to release all the cards that's what i'm hoping for but if they don't they're also going to just release the cards the commander players want. I mean, it is a commander set after all. So that bodes poorly for us popper players because they're just going to release all the rares, all the good commanders, basically. All the, um, you know, cards that those people want to play with. And a lot of these commons are not going to get added, you know, as far as I know. Plus, the cards only coming out in treasure chests. For example, the Old War of Preordain was only released in treasure chests and I think it was pretty rare so maybe there's that but I spent a decent amount of tickets on those cards and they just kept going up it for one old border preordain right now if I'm not mistaken it's 20 tickets on magic online so if there is good commons from the set and you know you can only get them in chests you know the price of them is going to be pretty high all the popper players are going to want to play with them plus the commander players because the good commons are going to see play in commander too so yeah, hopefully there's more done to rectify this situation. Again, I want to come at it from a positive angle. That's why first I talked about all these cards, not even on the, my top five list that I wanted to play. And then I wanted to kind of talk about this afterwards saying like, come on, we need all these cards. Otherwise, you know, we're just leaving Magic Online in the dust. Um, that being said, let's end on a positive note. I am really excited for these cards. 
all these cards I talked about, I think have potential to see some play in certain situations, some more than others, absolutely. Especially some of those from the first cycle, maybe a little weak. Uh, I just really like those adventure cards, but um, these all have, you know, po the possibility to see play in certain decks um, and maybe to create some really cool strategies we haven't even seen before. So really excited to brew with these. I hope we get all the cards on Magic Online. I have a bunch of brews lined up and, uh, you know, just hopefully those, hopefully those come through. Thank you so much for watching. Again, my YouTube channel is youtube.com slash snapbolt. Hope you enjoyed this different type of content tonight. Uh, sometimes I do like just talking about the new cards, seeing what's good. Uh, so subscribe to my channel, really the best way to support me. Thank you so much for that. Until next time. Peace.